It appears that God blesses some people in an exceptional way. For example, and there are many men in the Bible we could point to, but how about Solomon? If you look at his life, it seems that God exceptionally blessed him. Why did God bless Solomon? What did God say to Solomon that would indicate why he blesses anybody? Beyond that, the question perhaps we should ask is, what do we have to do in order to be blessed? Would we have to do the same thing Solomon did? And the other question would be, would we get the same kind of blessings Solomon got? All of which is to say, I'd like for us to discuss the subject of why God blesses some people and, more specifically, what that blessing for us might be. In order to answer some of those questions, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 9. Now, as most of you know, we've been going through the book of 1 Kings, and we're in that portion that deals with Solomon. One author has said, the writer next records what happened to Solomon and to Israel as a result of the king's provision to exalt the reputation of the Lord among his people. It uh, narrates God's covenant with Solomon in the first nine verses and further evidences the Lord's blessing in verses 10 to the end of the chapter. I think that captures what's going on in this passage. So first, let's look at uh, what God did for Solomon, what God said to Solomon. So these opening verses talk about God's part in all of this. For example, look at verse 1. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all Solomon's desires, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gilboa. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication, which I have made before me. I have consecrated this house, which you have built to put my name there forever." and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, in these three verses, the Lord is saying a couple of things. First, uh, he's assuring Solomon that he will hear uh, the prayer. Now, you'll recall last time we looked at the prayer, uh, which is the longest prayer in the Bible. And in essence, the Lord is saying, uh, I heard you. I have heard your prayer, is the exact statement in this passage. Uh, He is also saying to him that he would abide in that temple in a special way. Now keep in mind the context of what we're looking at in this section of 1 Kings is Solomon has built the temple and God has symbolically descended there to dwell there. So now he's saying to Solomon, I will do that. And furthermore, he says this, and this is perhaps really interesting. I have consecrated this house, which you have built for my name forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually, as if to say that I will see what's going on in Israel, and I will respond with a compassionate heart. So these opening three verses are simply telling us that the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time. Now, look at verse 4. Now, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David, your father saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Now, 
The Lord is beginning to spell out what he wants to do. And what it amounts to is this. He says, I will provide for a continuance uh, descendant of David to sit on the throne. But that has some conditions. So if you'll look at these uh, two verses, verses 4 and 5 carefully, he says, if you walk, then he says, I will establish. So there is a condition here. In essence, he is saying, I will bless you if you do what I have commanded you to do in my word. And the blessing here is to keep his promise that he would have someone from David's descendancy to sit on the throne forever. But there's a flip side to this. Look at verse 6. But if you or your sons will all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments, my statutes, which I have before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given to them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all people. Now this is really rather simple. In verses 4 and 5, he says, if you walk. In verses 6 and 7, he is saying, if you do not keep my word. So the point is very clear. If Solomon and the subsequent kings sat on the throne and did what God told them to do, then he would bless them. If they did not, he says, several things are going to happen. He would remove the people from the land. He would abandon the temple. And he would make Israel a proverb and a byword. As far as the temple and the people were concerned, it is clearly stated that if they did not obey the Lord, the temple would be destroyed and the people would be taken into captivity. Now, if you know anything at all about the Old Testament, you know that is precisely what happened. Eventually, they disobeyed the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar in 586 destroyed the temple, and the people were carried into captivity in three waves, beginning actually in 605. But the principle that is important for us is this. You obey and you're blessed. You disobey and you are, well, there are consequences. Let me, let me give that a title. You're disciplined. That's the principle in the scripture. Obey, bless, disobey, divine discipline. There is more. Look at verse 8. And... As for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Now, this is an extension of what he said in verses 6 and 7. And that is, uh, if the temple is destroyed and the people are put out of the land, then... He asked a question, actually. People passing by are going to make fun of the situation. They're going to hiss, to use the word of this text. And they're going to ask a question. A question why has the Lord done this to this house, to this land? And he answers his own question in verse 9. Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. Again, this is hammering home the second possibility. 
If you do not obey, there will be discipline. Why? Because they forsook the Lord. They embraced other gods. They worshipped other gods. And that's why he says all this calamity will come upon them. So the answer to the question is that they're going to be disciplined because they, for, they, they forsook the Lord and embraced other gods and worshipped and served them. One author summed up this whole passage by saying, As far as Solomon's family, God promised that Solomon and his son would always have descendants to sit on the throne, if they would be obedient. But if they departed from the living God and turned to idolatry, then he would send the people into exile, destroy the temple, and make Israel a byword and a proverb among the Gentiles. The temple would become a heap of ruins, and the visitors would be admonished and astonished at its destruction. The point is that God will be faithful to his covenant. And his covenant is very clear back in Deuteronomy. One more time. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, there will be divine discipline. That is the principle laid out in the scripture and echoed in this passage. God is faithful to bless and God is faithful to discipline. Now, as I pointed out at the beginning, in the first nine verses, God speaks about blessing. In the rest of the chapter, we are given a bunch of accomplishments by Solomon. And though it's not directly stated that these were God's blessings on him, many conclude that because of the introduction in these first nine verses, that's the implication. These are the things, at least, that God allowed Solomon to accomplish, and they're quite significant and impressive. So what I'm going to do at this point is just lay out uh, all these things Solomon accomplished. But keep in mind, what we really need to discern from all of this is uh, why does God bless some people? I just answered that, by the way. And uh, the second is, what does the blessing look like? Well, it's that second question we're going to deal with. But first, we've got to look at how God blessed Solomon. And then we ask how God blesses us. So this is going to take a minute. But uh, let's go through the passage and see what happened to Solomon. Look at verse 9. Now it happened at the end of the 20th year when Solomon had built two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, that uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with Caesar, uh, I'm sorry, cedar and cypress and gold as much as he desired and that King Solomon then gave him 20 cities of land in Galilee. Now, this is an interesting little development. Uh, when we know from previous passages that we've already looked at that uh, when Solomon built the temple and his palace, he went to the king of Tyre and requested uh, trees. Uh, he specifically wanted uh, cypress trees, and he wanted cedar trees. The cedar was particularly valuable in what they wanted to build. And this passage is telling us it happened at the end of that time that the king had done that, and Solomon, in turn, gave him 20 cities. Impressive. Uh, those uh, were uh, perhaps repayment for all the wood he gave him. I think what is also interesting is he gave him as much gold as he desired. Imagine having a friend like that. <laughs> Give him all the gold he wanted. Wow. Um, one author said, apart from the fact that Solomon should have been 
should, shouldn't have been so extravagant in building the palace. He didn't have the right to give 20 cities away and to pay his debt. All the land belonged to the Lord and should not have been given away. It's an interesting thought. Uh, verse 12 goes on to tell us that the king of Sire, uh, Tyre saw the cities which Solomon had given to him and they did not please him. Did you see that in the text? He, got, he was given 20 cities and he wasn't pleased. Why? That's an interesting idea. Give me one city. And he said, what kind of cities are these which you have given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Cabal. And they were to this day. That Hebrew word, by the way, means worthless. No good. They're not, they're not of any value to me. Now that is probably because they weren't the most productive cities. Uh, they weren't in the part of the land where you could grow some real productive crops. Perhaps that is what is going on. Uh, by the way, Josephus was a Roman historian that lived in the first century during the time of Christ. That's a thousand years later than this. But he records that the records of Tyre mention these very things. I thought that was intriguing simply because something outside the Bible confirms uh, what the Bible is saying at this point. Then the next verse gets even more interesting because says the king of Tyre uh, sent uh, 120 talents of gold. Now this verse almost seems out of place. Uh, it just said he was unhappy with the cities. Then why did he send him that much gold? And by the way, that was a lot of gold. Uh, those uh, 20 talents of gold were four and a half tons of gold. You can only imagine what that would be worth today. The point is, or the question is, why is that mentioned here? And the answer is probably that this is what he had given him before. Remember two verses ago it said he gave... Solomon, all the gold he wanted. Remember that? Well, this is the amount he gave him, apparently. And then he says, Solomon gave him 20 cities, but he was unhappy with the cities because he had given him so much gold that the cities weren't of the corresponding value of the gold. So that's probably how that got inserted in the passage. Then verse 15 says... And this is the reason for the labor force which King Solomon raised to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, the wall of Jerusalem, Hazor, Megiddo, and Giza. Now, uh, this says the reason. Uh, some translate that. The, this is the account. He used forced labor to build the temple, the palace, uh, Milo is probably the mounds that fill in the uh, city where there were some valleys. And the walls in three different cities, Hazor, Megiddo, and Giza. Uh, Solomon enlarged these cities to fortify them. These were to protect him. By the way, this is another situation that I find interesting. A number of years ago... Um, I was teaching uh, a class and I was just talking about the fact that there are all kinds of verifications of uh, things outside, uh, things in the Bible from outside the Bible. And somebody in the class said, like what? And that provoked me to do a little study and I ended up uh, spending some time just reading what all the archaeologists have discovered uh, pertaining to uh, the scripture. And in the process of doing that, I discovered there were some lectures uh, at one of the universities in Southern California by a very famous archaeologist. And so I even attended some of those lectures. 
And during one of those, the, the fellow, this it was not a Christian, this is just a secular archaeologist, but he pointed out that the three cities that are mentioned here all have similar gates that they've, uh, un, they've discovered these cities, dug them up, and they all have similar gates. And he had pictures and all this kind of stuff. And his point was that that indicates that at this late date, the meaning that far back, but as we say early date, uh, there was a centralized government, that there was some designer that is designing all of these, that it was, they just weren't independent, which I thought was rather interesting. At any rate, those cities he built to be uh, cities of fortification against an attack, and we've dug them up. There's more. It says in verse 16, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Giza and burned it with fire. And he killed the Canaanites who dwelt in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. Now, this is an interesting little thing. If you read the book of Joshua, it says they took this city from the Canaanites. Apparently, the Canaanites later took it back and then... Pharaoh came and took it from them. Then Solomon marries Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh gives this city to Solomon as part of the dowry. Boy, the way they throw cities around in this passage. <laughs> city here and a city there. What's a city? At any rate, uh, Solomon got that city because of marrying Pharaoh's daughter, which, by the way, he shouldn't have done either. Interesting. Uh, verses 17 and 19 tell us uh, these were storage cities for his chariots and his cavalry. And again, uh, I find that interesting. In a tour of the Holy Land many years ago, I was at the city of Megiddo, and the tour guide pointed out that there were stables for Solomon's horses, which is exactly what this passage is saying. Again, some extra-biblical confirmation of biblical data. Look at verse 20. All the people who were left uh, of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jesusites were not of all the children of Israel. That is, their descendants who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel had not been able to destroy completely. From these, Solomon raised forced labor to this day. Now, God told the children of Israel to go in and conquer the land of Israel, uh, Canaan. They did that, but they did not do it completely. They left some people. In one case, they got deceived in the process of doing it. So what this verse is telling us is that Solomon used those people as forced labor to get all the building done that we've already seen as we've been going through this book, which included the temple and his own personal palace. Verse 22 says, But the children of Israel... Uh, but of the children of Israel, Solomon made no forced labor because they were men of war and his servants, his officers, his captains, commanders of the chariot and his cavalry. So he used the conquered people and forced them to do the building, but he kept the natives, the Israelites, to be part of the army. So he didn't conscript them. There was no draft for the Israelites. He says in verse 23, Others were chiefs of the officials who were over Solomon's work, 550 who ruled over the people who did the work. So the Levites served as soldiers, verse 22, and supervisors of the forced laborers. Solomon clearly had a gift of administration. There are other passages that indicate that. And this is just one of the illustrations of it. Look at verse 24. But Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house 
which Solomon had built for her. Then he built Milo. Solomon built the house just for his Egyptian wife, which, by the way, he shouldn't have had in the first place. But she got her own house. So he was apparently able to lavishly provide. Now, later we're told he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I don't think he gave each one of them a house. But in this case, this is the early one that uh, she gets her own house. (sighs) Moving right along. We're told in verse 25, Now three times a year Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar which he had built for the Lord. And he burnt incense on them, on the altar that was before the Lord. And he finished the temple. Now this verse only mentions three times a year. But we know from other passages of Scripture that three times a year, all the men of Israel were to go to Jerusalem to observe one of the festivals or feasts, they're called sometimes. The Feast of Pentecost, Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So no doubt this is what uh, this is referring to. Only it's indicating that he sort of officiated over these. And while he was not a priest, he was king. And he was allowed to do that. Uh, Verse 26 tells us he built a fleet of ships. So he not only built this magnanimous temple, a huge palace, a house for his Egyptian wife, gave 20 cities away. And on top of all of that, he built a navy. One more verse in this passage. It says that uh, Hiram sent his servants with a fleet, seamen who knew the sea, to work with the, the servants of Solomon, and they acquired 420 talents of gold and yada, yada, yada. More indication of how enormous all of this was for Solomon. All right, we went through the passage. You get all that? What an enormous amount of accomplishment. Now, prior passages told us that he was a very wise man and exalted his wisdom. This is um, telling us that he accomplished all kinds of things beside his wisdom. I think if you said to the average Christian today the name Solomon, we would immediately think of wisdom and Proverbs. Uh, Maybe, maybe uh, you think of uh, Ecclesiastes or a Song of Solomon and the fact that he had so many wives. But he was a very accomplished man beyond all of that, as this passage indicates. It wouldn't be too much to say that God blessed this man, even when he wasn't obeying the Lord perfectly. I think one of the little suggestions in this passage is he kept the feast three times a year. So there's a sense in which he was serving the Lord at this point in his life. That changes later. We'll get to that. But uh, even in this chapter, we're told, there were some things that he didn't, that he didn't obey the Lord on. Clearly the one is he had this Egyptian wife. Now, the reason he had that wife and others was uh, political that they married each other so that there would be peace, there would be intermarriage, and maybe you could, uh, I don't know, justify, but at least explain it that way, as many do. But the point of this passage is that faithful to his covenant, in answer to Solomon's prayer, and in response to Solomon's obedience, the Lord abundantly blessed Solomon. Now, the very part, beginning of this passage, it tells us that the Lord said, I heard your prayer. Remember that? So this is an answer to prayer. He also said, if you obey me, I will bless you. 
And uh, apparently Solomon was at least partially obedient, but not completely. And God blessed him based even on that partial obedience. But the point of the passage starts with God heard the prayer, he promised to bless him, and then it tells all these things, and so you might conclude it was the blessing of the Lord. One author wrote, and I quote, The writer documented in this section further evidence of God's blessing on Solomon that came to him for his dedication to the Lord. However, Solomon's defensive work and monumental building drained the nation's wealth while providing only a temporary uh, appearance of strength and grandeur. And I like that because it puts its finger on the pulse of the passage in the sense uh, that several things are going on. Now, I said we we're going to talk about blessing. Two things. What do you have to do to get God to bless you? We answered that one, right? Obey his word, right? Second one is, and what does the blessing look like? Based on this passage, do I get 20 cities? How about one? 700 wives? I mean, what, how do you apply this kind of scripture? I mean, what's the point? And by the way, even that thing about if you obey me, I'll bless you, that's because he made a covenant with David. He said that. Well, that covenant with David was that somebody would sit on the throne of David. That doesn't apply to us. So does the principle apply to us? Can we say that if we obey the Lord, he will bless us? And what does that blessing look like? Want to know the answers? Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And look at verse 25. James chapter 1, verse 25. This, if you want, let me ask you a question. Would you like God's blessing on your life? Well, some said yes. If you want, listen, I'm very serious. If you want God's blessing on your life, you need to know this verse. Okay? Verse, James 1, 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one is blessed in what he does. How about that? Isn't that saying something similar to 1 Kings chapter 9? Absolutely. Only this breaks it down a little. There are three steps in this verse. Look at it carefully. He says, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now, by the way, does that little phrase, law of liberty, strike you as strange? I mean, doesn't a law restrict you? Then there's a law that liberates you? A law of liberty? Isn't that interesting? And this is the perfect law of liberty? There's a perfect law of liberty? What's that? Well, I think in the context of the book of James, it's very clear that it's love, it's mercy. That's the law by which believers are to live. They're to love, they're to show mercy. Well, at this point, he's saying, look at the law. Now, what's important is the Greek word translated look is not a mere glance. It's not reading your Bible in three minutes before you go to work so you can say you read your Bible. It means to stoop and look. The idea is to bend over and get a closer look at the, at the text. Uh, let's call that 
observation. Step one is observation. But by observation, I mean look at it. Look at it carefully. I just did that. Did you catch it? I mean, wouldn't it be easy just to slide over the phrase perfect law of liberty? I mean, how many times have you heard that and you just keep going? Well, that's a reference to the Bible, right? But you see, stooping down and looking at it saying, law of liberty? Interesting. Carefully observe the text. There's a second step. This is most interesting. He says, you'll look at the perfect law of liberty and continue in it. Now, what does that mean? Well, I would assume it meant that I'm going to look at it and then I'm going to go do it, right? Is that what it means? Look carefully at the text. Look at verse 25. Look into the perfect law of liberty, continue at it, not being a forgetful here, but a doer. So are there three steps here? Look, continue, do. Well, then continue is not do. There's something between look and do, right? So what's continue? Um, We're carefully observing the text. Did you see that? All right. Um, There is a Greek commentary written in the 19th century by an Englishman named Alfred. And he makes an interesting comment on the word continue. He says that the idea is not so much continuing in the sense of observing it in action as the sense of observing it in attention. In other words, it's a reference to meditation. So you look at it, You observe it, that's observation, and the second step is meditation. Now, whether that's in this verse or not, I'm not absolutely certain. I like the idea. But this I am certain of. You want to know the scripture? It takes meditation. The Bible is very clear about that. Uh, Bible study is one of the things that has interested me all of my Christian life since I became a Christian at age 18. How do you know what is correct interpretation? I've given a lot of attention to that subject, written a a whole bunch of material on it. But one of the things I concluded is, if there's anything in the Bible to tell you how to study the Bible, it's the word meditation. It appears over and over and over again in the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man. Blessed? Blessed? What are we talking about today? Blessing? Blessed is the man who does not walk, does not sit, does not stand, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Now, the Jews start their day at 6 in the morning, and they start night at 6 in the evening, so day and night means the whole time you're awake. Now, that's one verse. There are many. The idea is you look at what the Scripture says, and then you walk around thinking about it. Now, what do you think about? Well, I think you should think about what it means. What is its interpretation? And the answer to that is context, context, context. Every verse in the Bible has a context. You need to properly interpret the scripture. You need to look at context. You don't buy a house. You buy a neighborhood. You don't marry a person. You marry a family. And you don't look at a verse. You look at a passage. Get the message? That's one of the questions. There's an immediate passage you should look at. I think there's a second context. It's the context of the book it's in. Every book of the Bible has a subject. 
One of the questions you need to ask is, what is the subject of the whole book? And there's a third context, and it would be the context of the whole Bible. How does this fit into the, what the rest of the Scripture says? That's called meditation. And then after you think that through, maybe what you need to think about, and well, how do I apply this? Part of meditation is, how do I apply it? So, first step is observation. Second step is meditation. Third step, he says, well, be a doer of the work. Go do it. So, you go do it. Now, you can read it and know it, but you see, the point of this verse is, in order to be blessed, you need to do it. So you can read it, observe it, meditate on it. You can have your head filled with knowledge. Paul says knowledge puffs up, love builds up. But you don't get blessed until you do it. Aristotle wrote in one of his books, quote, this book was written for action, not discussion. End of quote. So, you want to know how to be blessed? James 1, 25. Get your nose in this book. Think about it all the time and do it. Now, all I've done so far is say, what do I have to do to be blessed? And in essence, I've said it's the same thing that we were told in 1 Kings chapter 9. Obey, bottom line. But I haven't answered, what kind of a blessing do I get? Do I get 20 cities? Do I get one? I'll settle for one. Uh, how about um, 700 wives? I think my wife would object to that. Um, so what are the blessings that you get? Now, I, I think that there's a lot to be said for that in the Bible. Um, but I'm going to stick with the book of James for just a second, and then I'm going to go beyond James. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of this detail, but if I just stuck with the book of James, I'd go back to the first part of the chapter 1, and I would say he's talking about trials, and he says that what you need to do is endure. Uh, so endurance is part of the blessing. I would say that he says in the first part of this passage, if you realize this is a test of your faith, and you trust the Lord, you will endure, and if you endure, you will be lacking nothing. You will be complete and entire, lacking nothing. In other words, part of the blessing in the book of James is spiritual maturity. Now, I think this is significant for this reason. In the Old Testament, God chose the nation of Israel and gave them a piece of real estate. And said, if you bless, if you obey me, I will bless you. And in the Old Testament, the blessing was primarily material, though not exclusively. It was, you'll get a bumper crop. If you don't obey me, you'll get a drought. And ultimately, if you persist in disobeying me, what you're going to get one of these days is kicked out of the land, which is eventually what happened. In the New Testament... We don't, we're not promised material blessings. I know, there's some TV preachers say, give me money and God will give you more. That's not biblical. Uh, God doesn't promise us an abundance of 20 cities. Matter of fact, Ephesians says, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There is a stark contrast 
between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That we're given spiritual blessings. So, uh, if you want the spiritual blessings of the New Testament, it comes down, among other things, I should add, to spiritual maturity. Now, what does that look like? Well, that would take a, not a sermon, but a series of sermons. Let me say one way to come at that is that you develop Christ-like maturity, Christ-like qualities. And I think that can be summed up. Well, Paul says the three greatest is love, faith, and hope. Uh, that would certainly be the top of the list. Or take another list, like Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Or Peter says, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge self-control. Wow. Self-control would be part of the blessing. And he goes on to say, brotherly love is part of the blessing of maturity. I think the ultimate of spiritual maturity is living a loving life. If you're looking into the perfect law of liberty, you will be blessed because God will give you the ability and strength and wisdom to live a loving life. Now that's just the opening verses of the book of James. I could go on. Then he says, this is what you get and then he says in verse 5, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. You can ask the Lord for wisdom, how to handle the situation you're in, and God promised that he would do it. I think if you keep reading, you'll discover in verse 12 that it would include happiness. And if you keep reading in the book of uh, James, you would have to say it includes righteousness. Now, we could go on and on and on. But I want to close by picking one virtue, characteristic, attribute that is part of being blessed by God. And all oh, is it needed today. I quoted Galatians 5 a minute ago. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Do you need peace? I know the world needs peace right now, like it hasn't in a few years. But you need personal peace. Yes. You know, this is a crazy world. Yes. You ever get anxious? Yeah. Ever worry? Don't shake your head. <laughs> Suppose I could give you a verse that would tell you how you could be guaranteed of peace. Yes. Interested? Turn to Isaiah chapter 26. If you didn't hear a thing I said today, please put this in your pocket or purse and take it home with you. This is one of the great verses in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Isaiah 26 verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because <clears throat> he trusts in you. <clears throat> Do you see that verse? You need to memorize that verse. That verse needs to be in your heart. And you need to practice it in your head. He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, like James 1.25, this verse talks about meditation, does it not? Whose mind is stayed on you. But unlike James 1.25, this verse goes beyond meditation. It says the result of meditation is trusting the Lord. Now you want perfect peace? Let your mind be stayed on the Lord. And as a result of that, just trust Him. And you will have.
perfect peace. I think I've told you before, there's a sign in our bedroom that says, give it to the Lord and go to sleep. I mean, what do you worry about that the worry is going to help solve? I submit to you that the vast, vast, vast majority of things you get anxious over, let's say 95% and the percentage is probably higher, don't ever happen. And besides, if you gave it to the Lord, he's better to take care of it than you are. As long as you're worried about it, he's going to let you handle it. Lord, are you aware you have a problem? Read the Psalms. That's what they do. Lord, I just, I'm knocking on your door again. I got another problem. Are you aware? He says that here. Just remind the Lord and give it to him. Now, if you're meditating in the word of God day and night, you will know you need to ask for wisdom. And the wisdom in the scripture will tell you what to do in the situation. You can, if that doesn't occur to you, go talk to a spiritually minded Christian who might be able to help. Matter of fact, there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Go ask two or three spiritually minded Christians. I know those are hard to find, but go find one and get some spiritual insight. Okay? And trust the Lord. And what do you get out of that? Peace. So here is the bottom line. Obey the Lord and you get blessed. And one of the great blessings is perfect peace. Disobey the Lord and you get divine discipline. That's the principle. It comes out of 1 Kings chapter 9. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Overall victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet still flowing fuller every day. Perfect, yet still growing deeper all the way. Trusting in the Father, hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in fulfilling your promises to us that if we obey you, you give us blessing, including perfect peace. Father, may the Spirit of God so impress upon our hearts and our minds this spiritual truth that we not only not forget it, but we practice it. In Jesus' name, amen.